Welcome to the Next Generation Data Analytics with BigQuery and Palm. I'm Chris Crosby, I'm a group product manager here at uh, BigQuery, and I'm focused on advanced analytics. Advanced analytics is a set of capabilities that we have within BigQuery uh, that go beyond just SQL. This is things like uh, adding Spark stored procedures, um, going after adjacent markets like log analytics and search, but then also things like AI and ML, of course. Join with me, Asinas, you wanna give a quick intro? Hey everybody, I'm Seamus, I'm the CTO at Faraday, and uh, yeah, we're a consumer predictions uh, company, but you, you'll hear about, more about us later. Yeah, thanks. So a, a quick rundown of what we're going to talk about today is um, we're going to give an introduction to Google's data and AI cloud, and I'm going to give a demonstration of our interface for that now, which is BigQuery Studio. We're then going to hit on some of the foundational models that we've actually integrated with BigQuery. I'm going to show a very lightweight RAG uh, demo with BigQuery data. And then finally, uh, uh, hand back off to Saturday, who will talk about how they've put some of these capabilities into their customer analytics platform. So ML is pretty pervasive throughout all of the Google Cloud data tools. There's obviously Vertex, which is this whole suite of machine learning tools, but then BigQuery has integrations for uh, doing machine learning at scale. Our operational data warehouse, uh, databases like Alloy and Spanner, they can use the inference endpoints that you would create in Vertex, and you can have Looker that gives those predictions back to the business. But what we had found by working with customers is the journey for creating these AI and ML applications you're gonna go across a lot of these products. They each have their own interfaces that you might end up switching programming languages. Sometimes you're even trying to move data in and out of these different systems. And that's why we announced this week BigQuery Studio. Our goal with BigQuery Studio is we wanna give you that guided path through the data and AI journey. Uh, it's, we wanna make it easy to tap into all of the different various languages. And as we started to build out BigQuery Studio and its interface, one thing that we realized very quickly is it wasn't just a UI problem either. We needed a more natural uh, programming interface for BigQuery other than just copying the SQL statement into a Python notebook. And so as part of BigQuery oops, Studio, we've also created a new uh, Python package, BigQuery Data Frames. This Python package, uh, it pushes the AI and ML processing that's done, typically it's done lo locally in your notebook, that's going to go back into BigQuery, and then that's gonna let you work with these cloud-scale data sets that you really need to build generative AI applications. Now the BigFrame package, that's gonna come pre-installed in BigQuery Studio, uh, Enterprise Colab, our uh, notebook partners Hex and DeepNote, but you can also just go and pip install this right now and uh, try it out. This BigFrame package, it does have two different APIs. One is BigFrames.pandas. Uh, it, it's not exactly Pandas, but it should be very familiar for those of you that uh, are coming from a Pandas background. And it is for data exploration. So the things you're gonna be able to do in here is things like uh, input, output of data. If you need to bring in data from different uh, source systems uh, and put that into BigQuery, it makes it easy to do that. There's um, data manipulation, including things like uh, indexes and sorting. Um, it gets you access back into the Python ecosystem, so it lets you tap into different visualizations you might be familiar with, like Matplotlib and Seaborn. And finally, it lets you write your own custom Python and then deploy that back into BigQuery and run your Python code on uh, BigQuery data at scale. The second API, BigQuery.ml, this is essentially BQML exposed as a Python interface. So all the BQML function that's built into BigQuery is also here. But uh, very soon there will also be a handoff to the Vertex 2.0 API. So if you did have a custom model, you'll be able to hand that directly to Vertex 2.0 and it'll understand how to work with that uh, big, BigQuery data through that big frame. So now that we have Python exposed in BigQuery, I thought it'd be fun to get started with BigQuery Studio and find some useful Python packages that we might wanna go try out here. So what you're looking at here is just our landing page for BigQuery Studio, which is probably gonna look familiar to a lot of you. And what I'm doing here is I'm searching for a table that might have some Python functions. And I'll go ahead and preview this data. 
And what comes back here is a bunch of information about the Python packages that are available in PyPy. Looks kind of interesting, so I'm gonna go check out the lineage. It does look like folks are using this. And I can go and look at the exact SQL statement that generated that table. And I'll trace that back to the initial tables where this came from. And I can see very uh, easily that this, through the lineage, that this really, this came from a BigQuery public data set. This is just data that we have in BigQuery that we expose to you to make it uh, easy to get started with a lot of common data sets. And so I now can go look in our marketplace, check out what that data is, and I see that it's got this, uh, 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 all the details about this, how it, where it came from, and now I kind of know where that data came from. I trust that table, so I'm gonna go ahead and start to look at some of the descriptive statistics that are associated with this. And very quickly, I can see things like, you know, there's about 4,800 is the average download of Python data. Most of the data in here is going with Python 3. So it looks pretty interesting. So what I'd like to do now is explore that further with the Python notebook. And so I'm gonna come in, and we'll turn it, uh, we'll spin up a new Python notebook. By default, I'm gonna have two different ways to get started with that data. The first example is traditional pandas, so if your data can fit in memory. The second one shows you how to get started with big frames. The background connections, these are all vertex runtimes, the same ones that you'll use uh, with Enterprise Colab. And if you're using big frames for the most part, you can stick with the smallest instant, instant size because all the processing is again getting pushed back into big query, not the notebook. So just a very quick, you know, getting started with pandas here. Here where I read in the data into a big frame, again, it is happening on the uh, BigQuery side. You can actually see the, uh, at any point, the job that's actually getting generated as a SQL statement behind the scenes for this. So there's a quick example. In this instance here, uh, when I'm creating the data and it stays in BigQuery, I can even give it unique uh, indexes. So if I know that I have a primary key in my table, I can let the, I can re let G, re the read GBQ know what that is, and we'll use that, we'll keep all the data in place. And you can see, okay, here's the data. Uh, I'm just running a simple head that came back, information about the Python functions. And here I can, this is just another piece of typical pandas manipulation. I'm doing a filter. I'm looking for the big frame packages that are out on PyPy. And you can see that there's actually, I'm trying to figure out the number of downloads. What are the popular downloads? And there's a lot of rows for big frames because every time I went and changed a description or a version, it created a new row. So I'm just gonna do a simple group by uh, via a pandas operation. And now I have uh, essentially an index of names with the number of downloads next to it. And again, um, well, I'm just now turning that into a data frame. And what I want to do though is I'd actually prefer that this data be sorted by the number of rows instead of by the name. And so I can reset the index. This is something you don't typically get in a data warehouse where you have to go, you don't uh, have guaranteed ordering, but we can create this within the data frame, uh, within the big frame. And so I can see that it, uh, uh, it used to be the name as the index name, but now I want to actually store these sorted index by the number of downloads. Uh, you can, we also do support multi-indexing if you need to go through multiple layers like you would in typical pandas, that's available. But what I can do have now is a sorted index for all of the Python packages uh, by number of downloads. And then let me just take a quick look at, you know, what are maybe not the most popular packages, those are pretty familiar to all Python users, but like what are the next set between like 20 and 50 that might be interesting for us to go take a look at? And so that's what comes back. Now, of course, this is all just a precursor. This is how you typically would get started with your machine learning, just exploring the data, understanding what's there. Um, there is a lot of text here, also associated with this data. And so I'll show just a quick summary. But then we're gonna come back to this later and do some more interesting things with the actual text description. So just a, a little teaser here. Um, now you may have noticed something that was happening on the left-hand side as this whole demo is happening, is there was versions of the notebook that were getting stored as we were doing all these manipulations. So I'm gonna actually go and look and compare the notebook that I was playing with versus the original notebook that I started with. And you can see where all the changes occurred. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just go ahead and revert back to the original notebook that I had and restore that version. And so now back, you know, right where I'm started from, I had that whole version history as we went. 
And now that I have this notebook and I have some cool packages, maybe I want to go share that with one of my teammates. So I'm going to go ahead and share this notebook with Joe Malone, our notebook product manager. Yeah, Joe. Uh, <laughs> and so we share that with Joe. We'll just go ahead and make him an admin so he can go and clean up all of my code and fix that for me. And now it's shared with him, and I can go save that notebook and uh, move on. And so that's generally BigQuery uh, Studio in a nutshell, and how you could use that to get started with some of uh, your data analysis. Now I want to get into some of the innovations we've actually done with the Vertex AI foundational models in BigQuery. So we've extended the BigQuery SQL capabilities with LLMs. There's now a remote SQL function that you can use to run a SQL query, and that's going to use the Vertex Text Bison model on your BigQuery data. Today, Text Bison is backed by Google's Palm 2 large language model, but over time, you can expect that those underlying models are going to continue to evolve, so you're always going to have access to Google's latest innovations in the AI space. What is I, when I said you know, integrated with SQL, what does that actually mean? This is a good example of what it means. What you're going to do is you're going to come in and create a remote model that references a Cloud AI large language model, V1. Again, that's Palm today. And then I can now run a SQL function that can generate text. I give it the model name, and then I give it a prompt along with any data that I might have that uses it. This example here, I'm generating some new data where I have a bunch of cities in a column, and I'm saying, hey, give me the country for these cities, and it'll generate new data that might be useful for downstream analysis. Uh, I can't go forward. Okay. I think this is... Yeah, so here's the next demo uh, very quickly to show off how we're actually using this. And this is a real example of something that we did on the Big Frames team. In this example, I'm going to use the BigFrames.ml API. So we used Pandas before. Now we're going to use the ML package. And you can see what comes back. These are mostly a subset of the BQML models. By the time we hit general availability, all the BQML models should be there. And I'm just going to set this up. And what I want to actually do here is I want to use the Palm 2 model to go and help us bug bash big frames, to help us find some examples that we didn't quite get right the first time, and we want to go fix that. And so what I'm doing now is I'm reading in a CSV file that contains all of the APIs for, um, for a pandas data frame. And I can go do a quick check and look for uh, the API. And when I read that CSV in, it actually does move it into BigQuery. Uh, and it keeps all of the, you know, the rows as you would expect, all the ordering. And so what you're seeing now is just all of the different API calls that are associated with the Pandas data frame. Now what I want to do is I want to set up my prompt. And what I'm going to ask the LLM to give me is I'm going to tell it to generate Pandas sample code for data frame, and then I'm going to list each of those APIs that were in that CSV file. So at that point, I'm going to run this prediction. This is speed up. This is sped up a little bit for the video. There you go. <coughs> and when that comes back, I'll show a quick example of what comes back, which is essentially a set of uh, example code for uh, in Pandas for each of the API calls. Okay, so that, that each of the, it gets cut off, but those are you know, full examples. But they're all in pandas, is the thing. And we need to uh, test big frames. So Python is typically pretty good at text processing. So very quick, just text processing function I have right here. I'm gonna tag it as a remote function. When I do that, what happens under the hood is that's gonna get deployed to cloud functions, and then it's gonna create a remote function in BigQuery that hooks into it. Uh, and so the, all that's auto-deployed, so you can actually run that Python code at scale. I can see the names of either one of those functions that were created. I can give it a name, so if I wanted to hand that off to somebody else or know what that name is or keep that in a data set, I, I could do that. But in here, we just created a default data set, uh, a default name. But you can go see I search for it, and it does exist as a SQL function as well in BigQuery. So I can come in, and you can see what this function does. It's pretty simple. But what it does is from BigQuery SQL, I can just put in import pandas as PD, and it returns import big frames as PD. That's a SQL statement that's running Python under the covers that you could uh, use as any other SQL statement. So back into our notebook. 
I now I'm just going to apply, this is a you know, standard data frame technique of applying that function to our original LLM code. And now I have a bunch of big frames generated code from the LLM that we actually did go and run against big frames to go find a bunch of bugs that we uh, could go troubleshoot. So what are some use cases you might have for ML generate text? Uh, uh, we are working with a, a beauty supply products company and they're creating um, personalized emails. So they have data in their database of columns that are like demographic information. Like this is a woman from uh, Kansas who's age 60 and then it's personalizing the message that they want to send to them. Uh, it's really good for a lot of common NLP tasks that can get problematic. So those things like classification, entity extraction, uh, sentiment analysis, uh, LLMs really can help simplify a lot of that. And then rewriting and rephrasing. So putting, um, we were working with this one call center uh, and they have a lot of transcribed data that comes from their calls. It often doesn't, the computer often doesn't get it right. It's kind of sloppy. And so they're actually using the LLM to clean up a lot of that data to make it easier to read downstream by the analyst. So um, now that we've talked a little about how to just call the LLMs from SQL and use that with big frames, I do want to give a quick example of how to take the, uh, uh, the BigQuery data warehouse data and use that to actually put some guardrails around that LLM. And I'm going to do that with a vector search using ML generate text embedding and ML distance. So before I hop in here, just to show you, before I hop into the demo, just to show you what we're, to get, so you have an idea of what's, uh, what we're doing, is the step, first step is we're going to train the semantic embeddings, which is we're going to take that Python data and we're going to transform it into numerical vectors. And then we're going to go find within the uh, the vector space, uh, similar clusters of information. So let's pop into the demo. So the first thing I'm going to do here is we're just going to create one of those remote models. This is the, essentially the same thing that you saw in big frames, but this is going to be just the SQL version of it. And I'm going to create a prompt. Uh, it's a table of prompt. It's just one prompt, which is what's a good Python package for working with embeddings in BigQuery? And then I'm going to go ahead and call out to the Palm model. And I'm going to get back the answer to that question using that model and my prompt, some good packages for working with embeddings. And you'll see what I get back here. And I can set something, things like the temperature. What I get back is DQ embeddings. It's a good choice for working with embeddings in BigQuery. It provides simple, intuitive API, blah, blah, blah. This sounds awesome. I definitely want to check out BQ embeddings. I'm going to go use BQ embeddings right now. So let me go take BQ embeddings and do a search for that in that list of Python packages that we have from PyPy. And it turns out there's no data because there is no package called BQ embeddings. It's completely made up. It's just a hallucination by the LLM. It's nonsense. So what do I do? So what we're going to do here now is I'm going to take the actual data about the Python packages and I'm going to uh, create vectors out of, for, for each of those based on the palm embedding model here. Now we do support other types of smaller models if you need those like uh, BERT and some of those uh, other ones, but here I'm, I am using the LLM one. And now, just so you can see what it looks like after I run that function in BigQuery, is I have on the left-hand side, this is an array of numerics along with some other information, including the original content that uh, I, I, I wanted to list from the table. So with that, I'm now going to create a stored procedure, so just a script that runs in BigQuery. And what it's going to do is it's going to augment that prompt as it, come in, as it comes in. The input is we're now going to be the, the prompt that I send it. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the query that comes in and I'm going to turn that into a vector itself. And what that's going to allow me to do is I can now search within the vector space against the, that Python data, against the query that I give it, and see what are the common things that are clustered around it. I'm going to use ML distance. ML distance is a brute force technique, so you're going to get the slowest result, but probably the most accurate result. Most of the functions within BQML do, does now support embeddings based on that, uh, what comes out of the content generation, but we're going to just use ML distance here. And I'm going to limit to the top five packages that come back. And then what I do here is I'm going to just loop through the top packages and I'm going to extend my prompt to understand what these packages are. And that way I have some guardrails to the LLM to say, hey, you know, provide me the answer, but within the, the scope of the data that actually exists and makes sense. Here's some data to feed in. And so now I'm going to, then the last step is I just rerun that exact same Paul model I did before, but with my augmented prompt. 
So I will now kick off that stored procedure in a separate call here. So back into SQL again, it's just a SQL statement, but you can see the steps as it runs. I'm gonna rerun that exact same uh, prompt, which is what's a good Python package for uh, working with embeddings in BigQuery? And now we kicked it off and you can see the, you know, we're now gonna actually do, um, do that distance function to find similar real data first. And that's what this is, show, that's what that is right there. And then you can see the prompt, the new prompt that gets generated. And so this is now the new prompt that gets generated, which is from the below list of Python packages, provide the answer to the question, then it's the input that I had, and then a list of real data uh, from the warehouse. And so with that new prompt, I have a new answer to the question about what's a good Python package for working with embeddings in BQ. And that answer is, the best package for working with uh, BigQuery is BigFrames. And that's legit, BigFrames actually does have a bunch of embeddings, it's the right package you should go use if you wanna to try to do this. So what are some use cases for vector search um, that you just saw? It's oftentimes good for long-term memory, so it's kind of expensive and processing heavy to create a bunch of these uh, vectors. So you wanna keep them just stored in BigQuery, that way if you have other algorithms you wanna do again, you don't have to regenerate the embeddings. Uh, semantic search, it's a very big building block for a semantic search, especially you can pair it up with things like uh, k-means model, which we also support and have some blog posts around, um, as well as just things like recommendations, find me some more things. That's uh, step one of what everything you saw just now is exists today, you can go use it, coming very soon, and we are looking for you know, preview customers for this. Uh, by the end of this year, we are gonna also support vector indexes directly within BigQuery, meaning that you'll actually have a, um, a way to quickly, uh, you can just point a, uh, uh, using SQL, you can just uh, define a vector index on a table, tell, point to the embeddings, and we will keep those updated in an index behind the scenes that's gonna provide um, approximate nearest neighbor search. Two other real quick things just to end on of ways we've integrated LLMs into BigQuery. Um, one is document analysis. Uh, real quick highlight on this one. Um, if you put your data through uh, document AI and you have a, bot, a lot of structured data, on the BigQuery side, we can actually generate a table of all of the information completely structured as a table on unstructured data with this functionality. And then finally, our BigQuery migration service which is a, uh, it's basically a compiler with a bunch of heuristics for converting different languages like uh, Teradata SQL into BigQuery SQL. We've now augmented that with additional AI recommendations. So if you don't like what's coming out of the compiler or there's something missing, you can just generate an AI recommendation and then accept or reject that. So with that, I'm now gonna hand off to Faraday to talk more about how they've actually used some of this stuff. Awesome, hey everybody. So I'm Seamus, I'm, a, I'm the CTO and the co-founder at Faraday, and I've heard us described as headless AI or machine learning for commerce. And we're built on BigQuery. The, the, the number of things that you know, Chris just showed is just scratching the surface of all of the functions that are revealed directly in, um, in the data warehouse. And so when a new function comes out, in BigQuery ML, we're often able to turn that into a new product um, on our platform. So let me see if I can, here we go. Yeah, we power the predictions behind a lot of call centers, tablet apps, uh, vertical CRMs. Basically, if you have a database of US consumers, then we can build lead scores, churn scores, uh, all sorts of all sorts of different things, and what sets us apart is that we're using um, third-party offline data, responsibly sourced, to enhance that. So instead of just looking at a customer in terms of the number of times they've come to your website or some anonymous device uh, details, Faraday actually knows every U.S. adult and can work from features like. Do you like to garden? Do you like cats? What's your household income? All that stuff. And, and something that's not mentioned here, but that we're, uh, we're happy to announce this quarter is uh, the ability in our models to mitigate bias along any one of our demographic features. And so, 
you know, let's say you're in, you know, banking or finance, banking or insurance, and you have requirements around uh, ensuring that you're not doing proxy discrimination. Well, you can actually actively invert bias uh, inside a machine learning model. So we're trying to follow Google's responsible AI practices and and, and build that all and, and make it kind of table stakes for anybody trying to do consumer predictions. So we also do LTV. And all of these things correspond to um, essentially functions made available to us in BigQuery. Now it's funny when Chris said, you know, create a remote model for the LLM, you know, create a remote function. The thing about BigQuery and BigQuery ML for us is that it's not remote, right? It's all happening inside of our data warehouse, and so we're not doing any ETL. And we've um, We've used all the different model types up here on the screen, everything from XGBoost to K-means to build real world products. And a story I like to tell is before BigQuery ML, our data science team would develop a new product, a new, a new approach, and then they'd pass it off to the platform team. And the platform team would turn it into HTTP calls and retry logic and all that stuff. But ever since we moved on to BigQuery ML, our data scientists are building the models themselves by invoking SQL from Python. So sometimes it's a lot to process when we look at you know, BigQuery Studio, which is an amazing innovation, but you kind of ask yourself, well, could I really build a real world application on top of a studio product? No, and that's not the point, you know, it's more for experimentation. When it really comes down to building uh, a machine learning product in this day and age, you're probably gonna be using Python to do the orchestration, to, to, to kind of set up the, the stage, but the ability to just invoke SQL and take all the knowledge that your employees have about SQL, which has been around since the 70s, uh, instead of having to relearn window functions and pandas and all that stuff. And again, Big Frames is a great product. My data scientists have been asking for lazy data frames for, for Big Query for a long time. SQL is really a great way to do this stuff. So. Um, Explain predict, that's a good example of a SQL function built into BigQuery that lets us create explainable AI so that when we do a prediction of pr propensity to purchase across 50 million customers, we're able to explain on every single row why that person got that score. Well, it's because they like cats or it's because uh, you know uh, they live in this area or something like that. So it's, it's, it's very feature complete. That's another thing I'd like to say about BigQuery and, and Vertex in general is that the variety of model types is, um, is very strong. And so, you know, I think one of the most popular use cases is time series, but you've also got classification, regression, clustering, and all of it works at scale. And so when, when Faraday was transitioning from uh, our previous provider to BigQuery ML, one of the things we're able to do is basically take tables that were 250 million rows and 250 columns and run predict against it with a, a random forest with 256 trees in it. And it just, you know, it took 10 minutes and the key thing was that it always worked. You know, we didn't have to, to build a lot of orchestration around that. So one interesting use case for generative in particular is sentiment analysis. And that's because when a client comes to us, they have structured data in the form of transactions, click stream, view stream, but they might also have call center logs or you know, other notes that their employees have, have taken or somehow collected. And so if we can extract this, then we can use it in our predictive models, right? We can essentially create features uh, from unstructured data. Um, and so here's a real example of a call center log. And then what we did was we tried to first use the cloud NLP function. So I hope there are product managers in the room. Um, and what we found is that it just didn't get it. Like when we tried to ask it, well, how does this person feel about financial products, the NLP API just didn't quite get it, right? It wasn't making connections uh, holistically. But then, 
you know, we uh, asked the LLM, we did the create remote connection uh, to a text bison model, and then we ran this, um, we ran this prompt, and we started immediately getting clean, uh, you know, a clean analysis of it. Now, one interesting thing about this is um, sometimes the LLM would respond with, here's your answer, and then a markdown block full with JSON, and then sometimes it would respond back with just plain JSON. And so, among other things, you can, um, you can tweak the parameters to ML generate text and turn the temperature down to zero to get a, a really serious answer instead of a really creative answer. So that's a good, a good tip there. Also, um, I, if I understand correctly, if you're trying to, if you want an explanation to be returned in a certain form, that would be a good use case for fine tuning. And fine tuning in, in, uh, in BigQuery ML's LLMs is related to fine tuning in Vertex AI. And it basically resolves down to make a, j a file where every line is adjacent uh, with an input and an output. And then the LLM kind of learns how you want it to respond to certain things. And there's other projects like JSON Former that we've been talking to the product team about maybe implementing. But anyway, this is, this is really cool because if I'm building a model for retention or lead scoring or, or anything like that for this financial client, um, I can get a sense of how people feel when, they, when they've called in. So this is something that um, is really cool and nice to have right next to the data. Another use case is content generation. And I was very happy to see this. I was at a chat yesterday with the chief data officer of, uh, and I'm going to mangle this pronunciation, of Carrefour, which is the biggest retailer in France and possibly in Europe. And um, he had a chart of projects that could be done with generative. And he had one axis was impact and the other axis was feasibility. And so the most impactful and the least feasible, at least according to his initial analysis, was something like a content factory that would allow you to generate personalized marketing. And so what they did was turn briefs into very targeted marketing campaigns. So what we're gonna talk about at Faraday though is since we have access to individual con consumers that a business has, and we also have a national data set of demographic data, demographic property, financial life event, all that stuff, we can actually personalize the messages on a per person basis. Um, so, you know, today, and this goes back to the whole advantage of BigQuery ML being that all this stuff is built directly into the database instead of having to be accessed through the network. You know, the, the previous approach was, you know, let's spin up a, a, a very robust HTTP call to some external LLM, which by the way, you know, you also have to be concerned about ensuring that whatever prompts that you send in aren't gonna get saved on their LLM, which is uh, another advantage of the Vertex AI Foundation models is you own that particular model and anything that, uh, that it sees is, is gonna stay uh, in, inside of your VPC. So the previous approach was again, the network, but with LLMs and BigQuery, we can create a prompt from every single row of data. And so here what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm joining my marketing campaign, which has one row per person, with my demographic data, which has one row per person in the whole United States, and I've just picked a couple different attributes to tell the model about. And so what I loved about this was that I took a real customer of ours that sells intelligent humidifiers, and I said, well, how would you rewrite this for an older person? And it immediately came back, and I don't know, maybe they should fix this in their marketing in general, but it's, it, you know, it's, it simplified it down to a humidifier that turns itself on and off. Now, content generation is fraught, and so one of the reasons we picked product descriptions instead of an entire marketing email to start was that th we can imagine rolling this out where um, you know, maybe it's under the fold. It's the kind of thing that once you've hit the initial marketing message that was written by a human, 
maybe we follow up with some Gen AI generated uh, customized content. But uh, some of the, um, I was actually talking yesterday with the CTO of the world's largest marketing agency, um, who some of you may have seen uh, keynote, and he was saying, well, take a rag approach, you know, uh, or maybe what Thomas was talking about, you know, in grounding and just ensure that um, you're able to ensure that the LLM is making responses from a real source about your particular product. Another, another time I tried this, and this was actually before I turned the temperature to zero, I asked it to, to come up with some marketing text for another product, and it invented a techno like a humidifier technology that didn't even exist. It was called like clear air or something like that. Uh, so you do have to be a little bit careful with that. On this use case, I will also say an interesting, um, an interesting possibility to think about is using the results of predictive AI, like decision trees, to inform your prompts, right? So like, if I'm gonna do this for all of my customers, I don't just wanna always have the marketing message be generated according to age and gender, right? Depending on product affinities, there might be different things that affect who that brand's clients are. And so, again, using BigQuery ML classifier models, I can build a model predicting who's likely to be a customer in the United States, and then I can look at those feature importances and say, well, maybe I'll take the top five. You know, maybe one of the top five is like an interest in science. And then I can add into my prompt, you know, rewrite this message for somebody who has an interest in science. So it's still early days, uh, but it's, it's a very interesting, and, 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 and chiefly, it's something that you can experiment with without moving this data anywhere, without you know, asking your data scientist to write any Python to take a CSV and hit an open API, or you know, some kind of an API. So that was our uh, two use cases. And if it, if, it can, if it comes down to one thing, it's the integration. I, I think that the lack of, e, the fact that you don't have to ETL stuff, the fact that Google research is essentially taking care of parallelizing everything, it, it, it really, um, I think, is a, it, an interesting approach that you should consider when you're building a machine learning application is instead of going towards you know, Python, Pandas, Spark, it's, it's interesting to, to build it just directly in SQL uh, because, you know, it's kind of the lingua franca.